the church is divided right down the pike today, Christianity, over law versus grace. And law takes you to the law, takes you to the old covenant, takes you to the law, and you put yourself in great jeopardy when you put yourself back under the law, according to the book of James and the book of Hebrews. And so we've been studying the power of importance of the new covenant on Tuesdays and Wednesdays out of the book of Hebrews, eight chapter, chapters 8, 9, and 10, and we're discussing it once again out of James. And so, you know, I've pounded this pretty heavy, but I just feel in my soul I couldn't pound it heavy enough because of the Internet and uh, people listening to us across Well, I don't know how far the cross, how far <laughs> we know nationally and internationally. But so the mosaic system. Now, let me tell you something. <clears throat> Everybody, <clears throat> when they want to talk about the law, they mention the Torah. And that's okay. But when you talk about the Torah being the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, numbers in Deuteronomy. If you think that that's the law, and and you you think that that's the full weight of it, you're probably right, with the exception of one thing. Not the Book of Genesis. They include the Book of Genesis, and I'm all for that. But the rest of the rest of it is a law. It really is the Torah, or the Pentateuch. But I'm going to tell you why Genesis is important in that. Now, the, everybody could have divided that just like they did. They could put the first five books. First five books is not about law. F only four of the five is about law. One book is about grace. It's the book of Genesis. It's the book of promise of grace. And the wonderful part of including Genesis in the collection of the law is that it stands in opposition to it. It's diabolically different. It emphasizes the promise of Christ and grace. And the rest of it is law, makes you a sinner, condemns you in need of Christ that's mentioned in Gen Genesis. The great book of Genesis is the book of grace that comes through uh, the work of Christ, like Genesis 3.15 and then into the Abrahamic covenant. Now, when you study the book of Romans and you study the book of Galatians, they make that very clear. They make what I just said to you is made very clear by Paul to the Romans and to the Galatians. These are great books on that subject. But there are four books about the law and the law was intended to curse you, not bless you. It was to make sure that you understood you were a sinner in need of salvation. And that if you violated one part of the law, you were in violation of the whole thing and therefore called a transgressor. And so we're going to go back to the subject because the church doesn't seem, at large, does not seem to get this message, although it's very clear in the New Covenant. They still don't seem to get it. I warn you not to put yourself under any system of Mosaic law. Put yourself under no part of it. Because it's serious to the Lord when you do. So I, I want to make sure... So here we are in James 2, 9 through 11. Here's what it says one more time. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scriptures, and then he quotes Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Listen to what he says. You're doing well. And the reason you're doing well is that Jesus said that if you fulfill the two great commandments about love, love God, and then love your neighbor, if you do that, then you fulfilled, you're fulfilling the whole law and the prophets. So, in verse 9, if you show partiality, that's bias or prejudice within the body of Christ, which is the subject of the chapter 2 
uh, 1 through 13. If you show partiality, you are committing sin. Now think about that. Bias, prejudice within the body of Christ. We're to be no respecter of persons. And when you are, you've committed the sin of partiality. If you've put yourself under the law, if you've put yourself under the law, the sin of partiality is on a par with adultery and murder and stealing. Think about that. It's on a par with it. Now, it's in your passage. Listen to this. If you show partiality, verse 9, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor, a transgressor of the law, the whole kit and caboodle. For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one, he has become guilty of all. For who, for he who said, do not commit a murder, do not commit adultery, do not commit adultery, and say, and said, do not commit murder, how if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now, the sin of partiality is a violation of Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. Be no respecter of persons is the idea. Do you understand? The sin of partiality is on par with murder, adultery, and the man side of the Ten Commandments. So it's very serious when you put yourself under the law. You may not realize that until you've listened to this sermon or listened to the last few on Sunday. Nevertheless, it doesn't matter because ignorance is no longer an excuse for you. I'm telling you the truth about it. Therefore, you need to realize, listen to this, violation of one is guilty of all and makes you an outlaw. Violation of one makes you guilty of all it makes you an outlaw under the law. A sinner, a transgressor. It's a pretty powerful place. Why would you ever want to put yourself under that when Christ has freed you from it? Why would you want to do that? It's the craziest thing I've ever heard. And yet I hear people, I hear people talk about all the time, dietary laws, a tithing system, Sabbath system. The whole system of the law is kaput. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 17, Christ came into the world, fulfill it. Romans, 10th chapter, verse 4, he's the end of the law, the end. Can you understand the end? He's the end of it. it listen, the law has been out since Christ died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. Why would you put yourself under that system? I'll tell you, it's a serious thing when you do because if you violate one, you're guilty of them all. You're guilty of them all. In Romans, the 13th chapter, verses 8 through 10, none of this is on your paper. I'm blowing it off the top of my head. In Romans, the third chapter, 8 through 10, it tells you again the same thing. Here's another one. How about this? Galatians, the third chapter, verses 10 through 13. Apparently, you know those. I don't see you writing them, and they're not on your paper. But you should. You should be familiar with them. Here's Galatians 3.10. It says, if you put yourself under the Mosaic system of law, you're under the curse of it. I just explained the curse. Here's a curse. Here's one curse. If you violate one, you're guilty of what? All. Is that a curse? <laughs> it sounds like one to me. Why would you put yourself under a curse? Cursed is everyone. Cursed is everyone. Cursed is everyone who puts himself under the Mosaic law. Everything written by the book of the law, if you violate any, in other words, if you put yourself under it, you're, you have got to commit yourself to do it. Violate one, guilty of all. You need to read Galatians, the third chapter, verse 10 through 13. Because he says, listen, he tells you if you put yourself under the law, the law is a curse. 
It's to point you to Christ, Galatians, the third chapter, verse 24. And he says, Christ came into the world to take the curse on for you. He became a curse for us. I mean, how much more evidence do you need out of the new covenant teaching to tell you, do not put yourself under any status of the old covenant. Don't put yourself under any. I don't care. It, you, you, see, here's the problem. You think you can pick and choose. Not once you go under the law. Once you go under the law, violate one guilty of them all. Paul learned that at the end of the book of Acts. The Mosaic law was designed by God to show that you cannot get... Have I had a word of prayer with you? Let me, let me stop and have a word of prayer. I can feel my engine starting to run. Let's pray. You understand the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. How do I get out of carnality and back into the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit? You have to confess your sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That puts us back into relationship with the Holy Spirit who will teach us truth. Father, we're thankful today for these who have come our way to study with us by internet and by automobile. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God about the Mosaic Law, violation of it, seriousness, never under any circumstance should a new covenant believer ever put himself under a Mosaic Law system. I pray, Father, this would be imprinted within our hearts today by the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. The Mosaic Law was designed by God to show that you cannot keep it and that you are a sinner in need of a Savior outside yourself and outside the Mosaic Law. You can study this by the, studying the book of Romans and Galatians. In Galatians, the third chapter, 24, Paul says, Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ. Well worth your read, the third chapter of Galatians. Well worth your read. Here is Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 1, a chapter we're in right now on Tuesday and Wednesday. For the law, since it, only, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very substance of it, think about that for a moment. See, you miss that. Since the law was only a shadow and not the very form or substance, what was the substance of the, of the shadow Christology? Christ coming, dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead. That's, the, that's what Christ came about the law. The law, since it has only a shadow of the good things, not the very form of them, can never, watch that, see the words not and see the word never. See, since the law is a shadow, not the very form of the things or substance, can never the law could never, the law could never, can you get that? Could never, can never offer continually year by year, make you perfect, can never make you perfect, complete, whole. Never, the word never make you perfect, never make you perfect. So here are two passages you should have. Here are two past scriptures you ought to have. Better get it now and try to hunt it back up later. Hebrews 9, Hebrews 7, 19, and Hebrews 10, 14. Listen to Hebrews 7, 19. The law makes nothing perfect. <clears throat> you know who found that out the hard way? The rich young ruler in Luke 18. He found that out the hard way. The law, well, I've kept these perfectly. Yeah, but you lacked one. So you didn't keep it perfectly. To keep it perfectly, you have to keep the whole law all the time, never failing one. You can't stumble one time. 
That's a pretty tough deal. That's why it's a curse. Thank God we're not under the curse. Christ has removed the curse of the law from our life. Galatians 3rd chapter, verse 13. Here's Hebrews 10, 14. Jesus Christ, by one sacrifice, that is him on the cross, one sacrifice made, made us perfect forever. Law could never do it. Christ did it. They couldn't do it year after year after year after year after year with shadow Christology sacrifices. Christ did it one time on the cross, made us perfect. When you come to the cross of Christ and believe it, believe it for your salvation, that he died on that cross, was buried in the race of the dead, you are made perfect forever, not by yourself. Listen, you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift, not of works. Why would you consider anything less than grace? The law is about works. Works is about a curse. Get yourself out from under that. How? Believe in Christ. Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You get removed from that whole craziness. Why would you put yourself back under it? That's the things that we'll be discussing in the future on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So let's look at five things in my hour today. The first thing you need to understand is a simple, a, a simple basic understanding about personal sin. The source of all personal sin involves two things, your old sin nature and volition. Personal sin is strictly for believers. Listen, an unbeliever doesn't matter if he commits personal sin or not. He's got no options. The only, only time he has an option is when he gets saved. The Holy Spirit comes in and dwells his body, lives inside his body. His body becomes the temple of God. Now he has the power over his sin nature. He has power over his sin nature volitionally. He has power. Galatians 5, 16, 17. Walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the desires, the lust of the flesh. These two are in opposition. The old sin nature is called flesh because you got it at birth and you will have it till death. The issue for the Christian is how do you control it? How is it controlled? It's which produces personal sin. James 1, 14 and 15. You're tempted, you're lured, you're enticed. You volitionally act upon it to gratify it. You've committed sin. How do you get out of it? How do you get out and get back? you got to confess your sin. Personal sin is for a believer. It's not for an unbeliever. He's under 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin. All men are under that charge. It has nothing to do with your personal sin. When you're an unbeliever, you don't have any options. How are you not going to sin? Willpower. That in itself is a sin. If you think that's any resolution. And what is willpower a resolution to? Only one thing, morality. Morality ain't going to get you anywhere other than a, a sinful life. It may get, get you something in society, get you nothing with God. Morality doesn't have any pull with God. It does with people, but not with God. It takes the blood. It takes the blood. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ, people. What can wash away my sins? You remember that old song? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, as a society of people, we like morality. But in the eyes of God, it doesn't make you any, it doesn't give you any clout with him. And morality is not equal with walking in the Spirit. It can't produce the fruit. Listen, morality can't produce the supernatural fruit, fruit of the Spirit. Can't produce it. 
It can mimic it, but can't produce it. When it mimics it, mimics it from the flesh and not from the spirit. Can't do that. And I'm afraid that's the way a lot of Christians live today. They live moral and immoral, never reach into the greater, higher standard of spirituality. That comes by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit over the, over the energizing uh, power of, the, of your flesh. The source of all personal sin is the old sin nature working with the volition of the believer and his violation of the law, and its violation of the law because of knowledge of the sin. Listen, you know, you know when the law becomes important to the, to the carnal believer? It identifies personal sin. Romans, the third chapter, verse 20. Romans, the third chapter, verse 20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's, what, that's how you identify him a sinner. And the law can't rescue from it. The law can call you a sinner, can call you a transgressor, but can't deliver you. Because it takes nothing but the blood of Jesus. You can't get it. You can't, the law doesn't save you. It condemns you. It wasn't designed to save you. It was designed to show you that the only way of salvation was Jesus Christ who would be born into the world and would die on a cross without sin for the sin of the people would be buried and raised from the dead third day. Listen, if you think you're going to go to heaven any other way than faith in that, you're mistaken. Don't let the devil deceive you because he knows he's going. Don't you go. Don't you go. Just because you go to church don't mean you're saved. Just because you hold the Bible don't mean you're saved. You've got to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ that he came into this world and died on a cross for your sins and mine, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, and now you have it forever. You have it forever because it is a gift. Forever. Here's James 1, 14 and 15. Each one is tempted. Watch the word when. Every time you see the word when on your paper, circle it. You'll find it important. There are markers. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by, an by his own lust. That's called temptation. Then when lust has conceived, now nah, well, we got an issue. Well, now we got an issue because volition has now got to act upon this sin nature, temptation being carried away and enticed, now when lust, watch the word when, then when lust has conceived, that's volition. That's acted upon gratification of your flesh. When it's been conceived, it gives birth to sin. Now you got sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death, temporal death. You're no longer walking in the spirit, you're walking in the flesh. Hello? That's called temporal death. How do, you get back, how do you get back into spiritual life? That's temporal death. How do you get back into spiritual life? Confess your sin. It's not brain surgery. This is not brain surgery. This is not even anatomy. This is simple. This is how it works. Notice that, listen, here, did you circle the winds? You know what they are? They're chain of events to personal sin. They are chains, they are chain of events to personal sin. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. That's why they were important. Here's King David. King David in a very important part. King David understood that when he, when he was found guilty of adultery and murder, in 2 Samuel's 11th chapter, and verse, 11th chapter and 12, here's what David said in Psalms about it, in Psalms 51.4. Now listen to this. Count the U's and the I's. Count the U's and the I's. Watch this now. Because this is your, my life. Against you, here's what David said, against you, talking to God, Against you and you only, I have sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight, 
and so that you are justified when you speak blameless and when you judge. Did you count to use? Talk to God, wasn't he? Talk to the Lord God. How many? Six. How many eyes? How many eyes? One. Six to one. That's how you live the spiritual life. Six to one. It's always about God. It's not about you. In fact, it ought to be a little I. Listen to me. When you're carnal, it's flipped. It's six about you and one about God with a little G. Did you get me? Because that's the power of the message from David's testimony. A difference between being spiritual and being carnal. When you're carnal, it's all about you. It's all about you're the big you and God's the little G. When you're spiritual, it's all about God Almighty and you're the little one in the group. You understand that? Point number two. There should be, listen, there would be some laws. Now listen to me closely. There would be some laws you would not violate if you lived under the system because of the area of your strength. When you don't. Draw this on your paper. Look up here. <laughs> I, got, I got all the technology in the world, and I don't have one little paper. What? Do this? Can you do that? Remember that? I don't, I don't know what you got. Diamond, a diamond shape. Put that on your paper somewhere. In the middle of that, write OSN, Old Sin Nature. Have you done that? At the top of it, is it on the paper? Is it on your, bull is it on your bulletin? Well, there you go. I'll have a bulletin. Oh, there's your Old Sin Nature. Well, there you go. Thanks, John. At the top of it, you have an area of strength. At the bottom of it, you had an area of weakness. See that? It's on the front of your paper. As well stated right there. Everybody has an old sin nature. And listen, every old sin nature has an area of strength, has an area of weakness. That's what I want you to get. Do you understand that? That's on today's bulletin, right? Okay, good. Way to go, John Dyer. Listen to me. Let me go with that. You got that? Everybody's got an old sin nature. You got an area of strength. You got an area of weakness. Everybody has this. All right. Now, here's what I want you to see. Let me go back to point two. There would be some laws, if you put yourself under the Mosaic law, there would be some laws that you would never violate because they're areas of your strength. They come from areas of your strength. Of your sin nature. Yet there would be other laws which you would violate because of the weakness of your sin nature. Now, I'm going to give you absolute proof of this in the life of one who had put himself under law, the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus. This is in Luke 18. He came to Jesus and asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, keep the commandments. And he, he, mentions, he mentions five of six. Agreed? There are six on the man side of the Ten Commandments. He, 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 he threw up the big ten on the man side. He said, he said uh, you know, and he list, Jesus mixed them up <laughs> because, you know, if he had put them in order like, he, like this old boy memorized him going through catechism, He'd have got him. He mixed him up and left one out. Remember that? Okay. And he left one out. 
listen what the listen what the rich young ruler did when he heard Jesus go through the list of the man side. He heard only his strengths. He said, all of these I've kept from my youth up. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the strength. He, he, he's a moralist. Oh, I haven't, I haven't stole, I, I haven't committed adultery, I haven't killed anybody. You know, I honor my father and my mother, right? Jesus kept one out. He didn't, say, he didn't say to Jesus, oh, wait a minute, you left one out. Because this would have, it would have carried the same conversation, but it went a little different because he'd have been a good student of the word, wouldn't he? He'd have been good. He'd have been a good keeper of the law. Jesus could have approached him with that idea. But you see, we only, listen, when you put yourself under the law, the only parts of the law that you like are the ones you can keep. You know, he never, he never talked about the law he couldn't keep that worked out of his weakness of his flesh. You understand that? Oh, please tell me you understood that. So Jesus knew it, and so what he did? He never did say, you've broke, you've broke the law of covetousness. He never, neither one of these two guys ever mentioned it in their discussion with each other. Jesus rather gave him an application, gave him an application of the law of covetousness. He said, sell all your possessions, distribute it to the poor, come follow me, you'll have treasures in heaven. And the rich young ruler immediately became sorrowful and sad. Body language. Never said a word in Jesus. And what did Jesus say to him? He said, you lack, you still lack one thing. You're not addressing the area of the weakness of your sin nature. You have absolutely given into it volitionally. And it has tied you up to such a degree that the law will not allow you out. And you're not willing to come to me that I can release you from the bondage of the law. Did you hear me? I, I, did, I said it loud enough, didn't I? <laughs> I certainly said it loud enough. And so it goes with the sin nature. So it goes. And so it goes. Oh, you're a hot dog when it comes to the strength of your sin nature. Oh, I'm a moralist. I can do this. I can do that. Yeah, because that, but where are you in the weakness of your flesh? That's when, that's when the rubber hits the pavement. You see, point three, when you violate one, you've what? Violate them all. He said, all, all of these I've kept from my youth. Jesus got him on the one out of his weakness that he couldn't keep, and he therefore had committed violation of the entire law system. Think about that. Think about this. If you're a college or a high school student, this rich young ruler he got 83% on the test and flunked the course. Think about that. He got an 83. He got five out of six right and flunked the whole course. Why would you put yourself under the law? I mean any part of the law. You can't pick and choose. You don't, you don't have that right to pick and choose. For whoever keeps a whole law and stumbles in one is guilty of them all. See, that's the curse of the law. Every new covenant church-age believer must understand the seriousness of this violation of one law system. Violation of one law makes you an outlaw as well as a sinner. Makes you an outlaw. You violate the whole thing. There's not one law. When you committed, when you violated one, you're guilty of the whole kit and caboodle. You flunked the course. 
You got an 83 and still flunked the course. Who would want to be under that system? Not me. I wouldn't have dog chance. <laughs> I wouldn't have a dog chance with that system. I'd be burnt toast every day. Here's my final point. Legalist. That's who those who put themselves under it, embrace it, and teach it to others. Legalist. Legalist, the legalist is often critical of the law that he doesn't violate, but others do. The biggest critic you would ever want to be around would be this rich young ruler until he met Jesus that pulled the, pull, pull the sheet off from his eyes or the wool off from over his eyes. This guy would have been the most critical guy to be around. Well, I've never done that. 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 You mean you never violated one law? Well, you must be Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, if you violate one, you're guilty of them all. And there's nobody can keep them all. The only person who was able to do it was God himself who wrote it in the person of Jesus Christ. The legalist is often critical of the law that he doesn't violate, but others do. Yet he is prideful of the ones he does keep, like the rich young ruler. He was very prideful to speak very boldly. I've kept them. I've kept them all from my youth up. And Jesus said, not possible. So let's talk about the one that you haven't. We can take care of that today. See, there's always a day. There's always a day that things need to be taken care of. Come on now. There's always a day when there's some things that need to be taken care of. And today's the day for your life. There's some things in your life you need to take care of. I mean, you know how, 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 how impactful you're walking in the flesh with your, with your people around you, the people that love you the greatest. You slap the hardest. The people that love you the most, you're the most critical of. Oh, you're strong in the area of your strength but you're really weak when it comes to the area of your sin nature weakness. You're really weak. What are you going to do about it? Make some changes in your life. How about that? Go to grace instead of law. Go to spirituality and rather morality. Jesus said there is one word about the, the whole law that if you get it, can break you free from the whole law. When he was talking about the whole law summed up by these two great laws, love God with all the heart, soul, and mind, Deuteronomy 6, 5, the Shema. Love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And the second is what? Is like unto it. There's something that put these on par. You know what it is? The love that you have for God, the love that God has for you become one in you at the point of salvation. And now that love of God that's in you, Romans 5.5, 5, can now be manifested to others around you. And love 
That love is the fulfillment of the law. Love, one word. The love that you have for God, when you understand that it is the love that God has for you, and when those two meet in salvation, and that love is poured out within your heart, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit steps into your life in the most dramatic way of salvation, and one of the great fruits of his being in you is this love, agape, Galatians 5.22. And we are the messengers of that love. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another even as I have loved unto you. Love one another. If you're looking for markers, it's love one another. You love one another even as I have loved you. You forgive one another even as I've forgiven you. You show mercy to those whom I've shown mercy to. And the list goes on. Because of the connection that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be all things to all people in the right way. Under the power of the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. It's important that we understand that. Because legalists tend to minimize their weakness and maximize their strength, and yet they both come from the sin nature. I'll give you another example of this. How we cr be critical when we when we're into the strength of our sin nature, how we can become critical of others. The older brother of the prodigal son. You remember when God threw a big party for the son who was lost and is now found, you know, all that? Remember that? You got to go back and read that again. Because, boy, was he a legalist and was he typical he was so critical. He said, I've been serving you all, all for years you ne you, and never neglected a command. You never gave me a big party. But this son of yours devoured your wealth with harlots. You threw him a big party. I guess I should go out and... Uh, Do the same thing, and then you'd be happy, wouldn't you, Father? Where did that come from? Your son went to war, was a captive, was a POW for years and years and years, and now he's come home. Of course we threw him a big party. There's so much wrong with what he said. There is so much wrong with what, everything he said. There is so much wrong with what this older son said. I don't have time to parse it. There is so much wrong with that. Listen, you can get the jest. He was so critical. He stuck his nose in the air and was just critical. He's a legalist. A legalist. Well, that's as far as I'm going today with it. Point number five is your homework. Your homework. All right? Remember, if you're under the law, 83 is not good enough. Let us pray. The men will take the offering, and we'll take a 50-minute break. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today. For the truth of the word of God. May the church come out from under the bondage of the law. Into the freedom of grace. The freedom of grace. Not the bondage of the law, the freedom of grace. And yeah, sure, Father, it's, it takes a while to get adjusted to freedom. I remember talking with Jane's dad when he came home as a POW. The difficulty that he, that he had of the freedom from war, the freedom from bondage, the freedom from prison.
And I think today, oh, thank you, God, that you've delivered us from so much self-inflicted wounds. Encourage our hearts. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. We should embrace it, love it, enjoy it, endear it, and teach it to others. The offering we take today, Father, we thank you that we're not under the law system, that you honor a penny as much as a million dollars because it's the motive of the heart, not the amount of money. It's always the motive of a heart. As a man purpose in his heart, so should he give cheerfully. We thank you for that. It's a grace principle. It's the freedom principle. It's the new covenant principle, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.